a patient has been administered isoniazid for the treatment of tuberculosis, TB. Which statement made by the nurse would be the most appropriate when teaching the client about this medication? A. This medication is known to cause peripheral neuropathy and therefore it is necessary to give pyridoxine prophylactically. B. This medication is associated with color blindness. C. This medication is expensive and may only be taken subcutaneously. D. This medication must be taken twice daily for 9 to 12 months. E. This medication must be given by DOT, directly observed therapy. The answer is A. This medication is known to cause peripheral neuropathy and therefore it is necessary to give pyridoxine prophylactically. Isoniazid is a bactericidal drug that is given for tuberculosis that has several adverse effects including peripheral neuropathy. This drug is usually administered in conjunction to other antituberculous drugs. Pyridoxine, vitamin B6 is recommended to be taken in conjunction with isoniazid to prevent neurotoxicity. Isoniazid is relatively inexpensive and may be taken orally or intravenously. It is not necessary to be taken under direct observation, and is usually dosed according to type of disease, active versus latent. The typical duration of administration is roughly 26 weeks. Color blindness is not associated with isoniazid treatment. All of the following changes may be seen in chronic asthma except dash. A. Hypertrophy and hyperplasia of mucous glands. B. Destruction of alveolar septa and pulmonary capillaries. C. Epithelial desquamation. D. Deposition of subepithelial collagen. The answer is B. Destruction of alveolar septa and pulmonary capillaries. Chronic asthma can result in a situation referred to as airway remodeling, typified by the following changes, increased airway vascularity, epithelial desquamation, deposition of subepithelial collagen, and hypertrophy and hyperplasia of mucous glands and of the underlying muscle layer. Destruction of alveolar septa and pulmonary capillaries is a common finding in emphysema and does not present in asthma. At what stage are antibiotics effective in treatment of pertussis? A. Up to 6 weeks. B. Up to 2 weeks. C. Up to 8 weeks. D. Up to 4 weeks. The answer is D. Up to 4 weeks. Antibiotics have been shown to have very little effectiveness in treating a pertussis infection older than 4 weeks. Because of this, treatment with antibiotics to individuals that have been symptomatic for longer than 4 weeks is not generally recommended. A client is admitted to the ACU with acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. The client has a recent history of bacterial pneumonia that has worsened and is at risk for hypoxemia. All of the following interventions apply to treatment for acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, except dash. A. An arterial catheter may be inserted to allow for blood pressure monitoring and ABG, arterial blood gas, blood sampling. B. Client may be placed in the prone position to increase the partial pressure of oxygen. C. Parenteral or enteral feeding will be necessary to meet high energy demands. D. The client should be given the highest concentration of oxygen that will yield a partial pressure of oxygen of 60 mm of mercury or greater. E. Daily weight should be taken to monitor fluid status. The answer is D. The client should be given the highest concentration of oxygen that will yield APO2 of 60 mm of mercury or greater. 
the oxygen concentration should be the lowest possible, due to the risk of oxygen toxicity seen in clients with FiO2, fraction of inspired oxygen, levels exceeding 60% for more than 48 hours. A young male presents to the emergency department after a motor vehicle accident. Upon examination it is found that the client will require a chest tube to reinflate his collapsed lung. All of the following correctly describe how a chest tube is placed except which of these? A. After placement, the tube is sutured to the chest wall and a dressing applied. B. During insertion the tubes are to be clamped, once in the pleural space they are connected and unclamped at that time. C. A common location utilized for insertion is the fifth intercostal, mid-axillary line. D. If performed at bedside sterile technique must be utilized. E. If air is to be removed the chest tube is placed inferiorly and posteriorly. The answer is E. If air is to be removed the chest tube is placed inferiorly and posteriorly. The correct placement of tubing includes directing a tube apically to remove air from the pleural space, and to direct the tube that will drain fluids in an inferior and posterior orientation. A 45-year-old male with COPD presents to the hospital with an exacerbation of his lung condition. He is in respiratory distress and the physician recommends he sit leaning forward. What is the purpose of sitting like this? A. To prevent falling. B. To help inhale air. C. To prevent loss of consciousness. D. To easily cough out secretions. E. To help exhale air. The answer is E. To help exhale air. COPD is a chronic lung condition marked by air trapping. Patients with COPD are instructed to sit in the tripod position to help them exhale air. Patients sit and lean forward to help maximize air exiting from the lungs. Which of the following best describes the mechanism of albuterol inhalers during an asthma exacerbation? A. Alpha-adrenergic antagonist. B. Beta-adrenergic antagonist. C. Beta-adrenergic agonist. D. Alpha-adrenergic agonist. E. None of these. The answer is C. Beta-adrenergic agonist. Albuterol is a beta-adrenergic agonist. It helps to open up the airways during an asthma exacerbation by activating the beta-adrenergic receptors, part of the sympathetic nervous system. Side effects include increased heart rate. What is the inspiratory reserve volume? A. The amount of air that can be exhaled after normal inhalation. B. The amount of air that can be inhaled after normal inhalation. C. The amount of air available in the lungs after exhalation. D. The normal amount of air that is inhaled with each breath. E. The total amount of air the lung can contain. The answer is B. The amount of air that can be inhaled after normal inhalation. The inspiratory reserve volume for the average adult is roughly 3,100 milliliters. It is tested using pulmonary function tests. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of air able to be inhaled after a regular inhalation. This is in contrast to the expiratory reserve volume, which is the amount of air that can be exhaled after a regular exhalation. Which of the following side effects would you most likely expect when providing an asthmatic patient with continuous nebulizer therapy? A. Bradycardia. B. Hyperthermia. C. Dachycardia. D. Pinpoint pupils. E. 
hypothermia. The answer is C. Dachycardia. Asthma is treated with albuterol. This drug is a beta-2 agonist, which works to relax smooth muscle in the lungs, and open up the airways. A consequence of this drug is the beta-2 effects on the heart. Beta-2 on the heart causes an increase in heart rate, dachycardia, and is a common side effect seen in the treatment of asthmatics. You are a pulmonology nurse taking care of a patient who complains of episodic wheezing. You perform a diagnostic test in which you perform pulmonary function tests on the patient before and after administering albuterol, a beta-2 adrenergic agonist. You note that the patient's symptoms and FEV1 readings improve drastically with bronchial administration. Based upon these findings, the patient most likely has which of the following? A. Lung cancer. B. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. C. Sarcoidosis. D. Asthma. E. Throat cancer. The answer is D. Asthma. Asthma is an inflammatory airway condition that is characteristically improved symptomatically and quantitatively, in terms of pulmonary function tests, including FEV1 readings, with bronchial administration, for example albuterol, the beta-2 adrenergic agonist administered in this patient. In this patient who presented for evaluation of wheezing, a characteristic symptom of asthma. His substantial response to bronchial administration makes the likelihood of an asthma diagnosis very high. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is an obstructive physiology of the airways often due to chronic tobacco smoking. While bronchial litters may be of some clinical value in these patients, their FEV1 readings characteristically do not correct after bronchial litter administration as this is a major method in which COPD can be distinguished from asthma and other inflammatory airway conditions. Sarcoidosis, lung cancer, and throat cancer symptoms would not necessarily improve with bronchial administration, nor would pulmonary function test readings in patients with these conditions. A 45-year-old obese male with a history of obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease presents to your primary care clinic for help in managing his fatigue due to his sleep apnea. He is not a candidate for tonsillectomy and atoidectomy. Which of the following interventions would be the best recommendation to treat his obstructive sleep apnea? A. Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Mask, CPAP. B. Metobrilol. C. Insulin. D. Metformin. E. Temsulosin. The answer is A. Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Mask, CPAP. CPAP mask helps to force airway into the lungs that is otherwise obstructed by the patient's oropharyngeal anatomy as standard breathing pressures due to obstructive sleep apnea. When wearing a CPAP mask, typically when sleeping, snoring is reduced, and oxygenation is improved, allowing patients to have a more restful sleep and feel less fatigued the following day, while medications like metoprolol, insulin, and metformin may be beneficial to the patient in treating his conditions comorbid to obstructive sleep apnea, they do not have a direct effect on treating his sleep apnea or the resultant fatigue. Tamsulosin is an alpha-adrenergic blocker and can be used to treat benign prostatic hyperplasia among other conditions, but not obstructive sleep apnea. Which of the following best describes a diagnosis of uncomplicated or simple silicosis? A. Silica in the bloodstream but no clinical symptoms. B. Mild ventilation restriction and fibrosis on chest x-ray. C. Normal pulmonary function but shortness of breath. D. Massive pulmonary fibrosis visible on chest x-ray.
but no extrapulmonary symptoms. The answer is B. Mild ventilation restriction and fibrosis on chest x-ray. Simple silicosis results in mild ventilation restriction and fibrosis on chest x-ray. Simple silicosis often results from long-term exposure to relatively low concentrations of silica dust, where symptoms usually appear 10 to 30 years after exposure. A 63-year-old female client is newly admitted to the hospital for pneumococcal pneumonia. The nurse recognizes that this patient will most likely exhibit certain symptoms associated with this condition. Which clinical findings are most commonly consistent with pneumococcal pneumonia? A. Headache, muscle aches, and a cough with frothy pink sputum. B. Slow onset of cough, nasal congestion, sore throat, and fever. C. Fever, chills, and a non-productive cough. D. Sudden onset of fever, chills, with a productive cough with rust-colored sputum. E. Dry cough with fatigue, nausea and vomiting. The answer is D. Sudden onset of fever, chills, with a productive cough with rust-colored sputum. Pneumococcal, bacterial. Pneumonia typically presents with an abrupt onset of fever, shaking chills, and a productive cough, usually rust in color. Usually viral pneumonias will present with a dry non-productive cough and associated with other viral infections. What population is most at risk during pertussis infection? A. Infants. B. Adolescents. C. Pregnant women. D. Elderly. The answer is A. Infants. Due to their susceptibility to suffocation, infants are more at risk of mortality than older children, pregnant women, or the elderly during pertussis infection. Mortality in infants with this condition can be as high as 2%. There is also an increase in infant comorbidities such as pneumonia, encephalopathy, seizures, and failure to thrive. You are the nurse taking care of a 78-year-old man with a 60-pack year smoking history who is hospitalized for shortness of breath. You review the x-ray and notice a 1 cm solitary pulmonary nodule within the middle lobe of the right lung. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? A. Attempt to obtain and review a prior x-ray. B. Refer the patient for surgical excision of the nodule. C. Arrange for a biopsy of the nodule. D. Administer radiotherapy to the pulmonary nodule. E. Administer chemotherapy. The answer is A. Attempt to obtain and review a prior x-ray. While the patient appears to have a very concerning story for a primary lung neoplasm given his age and smoking history, or a metastasis from another neoplasm, if this nodule was noted on a prior x-ray, especially a much older x-ray, and is unchanged, then the degree of concern about the nodule is much lower, given its stability over time. On the contrary, if you can obtain a recent prior x-ray and the nodule is not present on that scan, or has grown since that scan, then the level of concern about the nodule should be greater, and should guide clinical decision making as such, measures such as biopsy, surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy administration are all possible feature steps if indeed this pulmonary nodule turns out to be a malignant neoplasm. That being said, there is no definite evidence at this time that the patient's nodule is of malignant origin, and should this nodule be something that has been stable on prior x-rays for multiple of years, then the level of concern should be far lower, and the need for more invasive measures would be obviated. 
Which of the following terms describes the congenital abnormality of the forebrain in which an infant is born with a diminished brain size? A. A jury. B. Microcephaly. C. Polymicrogyry. D. Anencephaly. The answer is B. Microcephaly. Microcephaly denotes a congenital abnormality of the forebrain in which an infant is born with a diminished brain size. Potential causes include fetal alcohol syndrome, congenital rubella, and trisomy 18. The other answers are all examples of congenital forebrain birth defects. Anencephaly is the complete absence of major portions of the brain, skull, and scalp. A jury is the absence of jury. Polymicrogyry is a condition in which jury are too many, too small, and very shallow. Anencephaly and other neural tube defects have been linked to maternal deficiency of what nutrient? A. Calcium. B. Biotin. C. Phthalate. D. Beta carotene. The answer is C. Phthalate. Anencephaly and other neural tube defects have been linked to maternal deficiency of phthalate. This is most likely due to phthalate's role in methylation and nucleic acid synthesis. The other nutrients listed are all important to maternal health but have no known correlation with neural tube defects such as anencephaly. Paraventricular leukomalacia, PVL is the most common finding on autopsy of newborns with what condition? A. Fetal alcohol syndrome. B. Cerebral palsy. C. Anencephaly. D. Hypoxia. The answer is B. Cerebral palsy. Paraventricular leukomalacia is the most common finding on autopsy of newborns with cerebral palsy. PVL involves the softening of the brain tissue and subsequent death of the white matter. This is caused by lack of blood flow to the paraventricular area of the brain, which results in necrosis and gliosis of brain tissue. Neonates born with PVL are likely to have mental impairment, motor disorders, and compromised vision and hearing. PVL is usually diagnosed with ultrasound of the head. None of the other conditions listed typically present with this finding. A mother one hour post birth expresses concern because her baby's head looks slightly cone shaped. The nurse tells the mother that dash. A. This is normal and usually temporary. B. This is normal but is not temporary. C. This is abnormal but does not require immediate medical intervention. D. This is abnormal and she should consult a neurologist. E. This is abnormal and she should contact her pediatrician. The answer is A. This is normal and usually temporary. It is normal for a child's head to be slightly misshapen immediately following birth. The infant's skull is composed of bony plates connected by membranes, fontanels, allowing for accommodation of the baby's growing brain. Caput succedentum, swelling of the scalp, can also be found following a long delivery. A misshapen head usually resolves on its own and is normal but does not require any medical intervention. A baby is born with a heart rate of 99 beats per minute, irregular breathing, good flexion, frowns when you suction the nose, and with pink color throughout the body and limbs. What is the baby's APGAR score at 1 minute? A. 9. B. 8. C. 7. D. 10. E. 6.
The answer is C. 7. An APGAR, Appearance Pulse Grimace Activity Respiration, score is a quick assessment designed to indicate the condition of the baby after birth. Referring to the APGAR scoring method, point allocations are as follows. Heart rate of less than 100, 1. Good flexion, 2. Frown, reflex, 1. Irregular respirations, 1. Pink skin color, 2. We add these to get the final APGAR score of 7. A baby is born with a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. The baby is not breathing, has limp limbs, is flaccid and pale. What is the baby's APGAR score at 1 minute? A. 1. B. 4. C. 2. D. 8. E. 0. The answer is A. 1. An APGAR, Appearance Pulse Grimace Activity Respiration, score is a quick assessment designed to indicate the condition of the baby after birth. Referring to the APGAR scoring method, point allocations are as follows. Heart rate less than 100, 1. Poor flexion, 0. Absent reflex, 0. Apnea, 0. Pallor, 0. We add these individual scores to get the APGAR score of 1. A pair of new parents are concerned because their baby has lost 4% of its birth weight at 3 days of life. The nurse instructs the parents to dash. A. Consider switching brands of formula. B. Continue feedings as usual. C. Feed every 5 hours. D. Notify a pediatrician. E. Feed only breast milk until the infant's weight increases. The answer is B. Continue feedings as usual. It is common for infants to lose up to 10% of their weight in the first week of life. Greater than a 10% loss indicates a problem. For an infant within these parameters, there is no need to make a change in feedings. Infants in the first week of life should be fed every 2 to 3 hours if breastfeeding and every 3 to 4 hours if formula feeding. Julie is a new registered nurse who is assessing a child in his third month of life. The assessment is part of a routine appointment at a public health clinic. She knows that the anterior fontanelle of most infants closes between dash a 18 to 20 months of age b 3 to 6 months of age c 1 to 3 months of age d 6 to 9 months of age e 12 to 18 months of age The answer is E. 12 to 18 months of age. The anterior fontanelle is commonly referred to as the soft spot located atop a child's head. It allows considerable brain growth until it closes, generally between 12 to 18 months. However, the fontanelle may close on some children as early as 9 months. Which of the following is considered a late sign of hunger in the newborn? A. Crying. B. Sucking motions. C. Bringing hands to chin. D. Rooting. E. Chewing on the fists. The answer is A. Crying. Crying is considered a late sign of hunger. By the time the infant cries, they may be more difficult to console or to feed, especially if breastfeeding. Feed on cue when the infant is rooting, making sucking motions, or when they are frequently bringing their hands to their face or mouth. Which of the following should the nurse do if he or she finds a baby with irregular breathing? A. 
Check oxygenation through a portable pulse oximeter. B. Note the finding on the patient's chart. C. Check for oral obstruction of the infant's airway. D. Deliver oxygen through a simple mask. The answer is B. Note the finding on the patient's chart. It is normal for infants to breathe irregularly. Often, brief periods of apnea are present. Infants should breathe between 30 and 60 times per minute. For this purpose, noting the finding as a vital sign in the patient's chart is the correct action. No further intervention is necessary in response to a normal assessment.